Reading a post to, to write for the project, um, it, was, it was quite related to things I've done before. I've done a lot of what are called development education residencies in schools. And what we do there is uh, writers are asked, bring, are brought in to write about different social issues. And the reason we do that, not because we are experts in any way, and we know much about it, but because when they bring people in from the charities who do know about these issues, the children listen and they're attentive and they take the facts in but it's very hard to get them to care. And so one of the, the, the original topics that I dealt with, for instance, would have been child labor. And you could say a figure like 350 children, 350 million children every year are involved in child labor. And it's a shocking statistic, but it doesn't affect you emotionally because we cannot empathize with 350 million people. It's simply impossible. So with the stories we write, we try and say, right, well, let's see if you can make you care about one. Because if we make you care about one, then perhaps you'll be driven to do something about it. Because we're not rational creatures. You know, we like to think we're rational. We're not. Um, we are emotional creatures who occasionally act rationally. <coughs> so when I started writing pieces for the blogs, we were, the, the, the brief was very open. In fact, it was so open that when all the writers got together, we stood around and going, does anybody know what we're supposed to do? We um, and we're all very different writers. About as different as it's possible to be, actually. Um, so everybody wanted to do different things. And what I decided was, as much as possible, I would try and write stories for the blog. Every piece would try and, I would try and write every piece of story if I could. Um, so I wanted to write different types of stories as well. So some of them were little poems or ditties. Some of them were um, uh, different genres. And one of the more genres I wanted to write, I wanted to write um, a crime story or a story that had a crime feel to it. Uh, because I liked crime. I was writing a lot of it. I was reading a lot of it. Um, so there are two stories on the blog that involve these two characters. Uh, this is the second one. And with each, rather than trying to be, deal with the whole issue of climate change, what I wanted to do was deal with a little facet of it each time. So um, to deal with, for instance, why is it that we'll, we'll spend any, no, any amount of money dealing with terrorism, but we won't turn that money to something that actually is much more of a greater threat. Um, so each of these crime stories deals with a facet of climate change, uh, and this is one of them. Um, you're okay. Is it? Sorry. You're living up here. I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be enough because you didn't know. Uh, she'd actually be no. more yeah, driving. Okay. Let's, 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 does everybody? Does, does, should, do you want to get fierce now before I start? Because it's a long story. Um, oh, I should also point out that it was Berta who chose this. Um, I haven't read it out loud before, and I have a heavy cold. So if I cough or scuffle my way through it, that's why I'm normally reasonably um, coughed. Not, not part of the story, then. It was? When you cough. Not part no, of the story. no, it's, well, you can include it in the dialogue if it fits, you know. <laughs> <coughs> One of them smokes. Um, okay. So this piece is called The Giants in the Water. Um, that was one of the other things. The first one was written when I was in Australia, um, and it was set in Australia, it was set during a bushfire, or after a bushfire. This one was written after I'd been to London, so I decided, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it for each place I visit, I'm going to do one of these stories with these characters. So, uh, there'll be one about Germany somewhere along the line. <coughs> Excuse me. The huge machines jutted up out of the water like the bowed backs of giant armoured warriors, their shoulders hunched as if ready to link arms to withstand the coming surge of the tide. Most of the gates they held between them were still invisible below the water. It remained to be seen if they could be lifted in time to stop what was coming. Spanning the 520 metre width of the river and standing as high as a five-storey building, the Thames Barrier was the single biggest flood defence barrier in the world, and in economic terms at least the world's most important barrier. If it failed to work today, everyone would find out why. They're like giant warriors, Blowfly said, jutting up out of the water like that, their backs hunched, ready to lift those gates. What are you talking about? His partner frowned, taking a drag on her cigarette and blowing some smoke. The machines, like giants, he repeated. Germ threw him a quizzical glance and then turned her gaze to the massive engineering works in front of them. The two investigators were standing about 50 metres upstream on the north bank of the Thames. Behind them was a park, across the river from them, the barrier's information centre and a car park. From their vantage point, they could see the police divers pulling the dead body out of the water and into their, their rigid inflatable boat. 
Germ squinted at one of the steel and concrete towers. They were topped by what she thought looked like an armadillo's shell, with a big section cut out of the middle, but even that didn't des describe them properly. How are they like giants, exactly? she asked. They're big, bloody, I don't know, machine islands. It's just a metaphor, Blowfly sighed. Never mind. That help you much when you're investigating a terrorist act, she inquired, making up metaphors. Helps get the synapses firing, does it? Never mind, he growled. Bill Flynn and Jemima Hearn, known to their colleagues as Blowfly and Germ, were part of an international unit attached to Interpol that investigated crimes with far-reaching consequences. The dead body wasn't the reason they were here, but they expected it would tie in soon enough. They had been called because a gang of well-organised criminals had broken into the control centre of the Thames Barrier in the dark hours of the morning and destroyed the main computer. They hadn't stopped there. They obviously knew that each of the ten gates that stretched between the towers could be closed using its own controls, and the gang had succeeded in breaking through to the access tunnels and damaging most of the individual controls as well. Several workers and security guards had been injured in the attack. This must be what it feels like to be on the subs bench in the Premiership, Blowfly commented. Hmm. Germ agreed. They were only one of a number of units represented at the scene, and Blowfly and Germ were having to step back and wait their turn to look around. As well as the Met's Marine Policing Unit, there were officers from Counter-Terrorism Command, and, Germ suspected, but couldn't be sure, a few spooks from MI5. She and her partner were here to study the big picture, to investigate the potential repercussions of the crime beyond London or even Britain. But there was a pecking order here, and Counter-Terrorism Command were the ones with the biggest, sharpest beaks. In the UK, terrorism trumped every other crime, and this was the CTC's turf. Germ was tall, with cropped, untidy, dark brown hair. She had a face that was attractive in a hard-bitten type of way, but looked designed to deliver bad news. Blowfly was a few inches shorter, a tidy, trimly built man with fine-boned Chinese features, a gentle manner and an Irish accent. Germ chewed her lip as she flicked her cigarette butt out into the river. I wish you wouldn't do that, Blowfly said. Yeah, I know, sorry. This case was already getting messy, and she wondered if being here was a waste of their time. A few metres away from Germ was another man by the name of Grinnell, a thick-set, sallow-skinned man with dark, bushy hair and beard. He was one of the engineers from the Environment Agency who managed the barrier. He was here to liaise with the police, but they were all waiting for the body to be brought ashore now, so he had time to fret about the gigantic machines out in the river. Grinnell had a pair of binoculars pressed to his eyes and was anxiously watching the gates. The attack on the barrier had been carefully timed. There was a storm surge expected from the North Sea, a colossal rush of water that would flow right up the river towards London. If the gates were not closed in time, a huge area of the city could be flooded. Millions of people and billions of pounds in property lay in the path of the surge. If the river flooded the city, the damage and the possible death toll would be catastrophic. So they're having to crank those gates closed by hand, Blowfly asked the engineer. Yes, Brunel answered tersely. The outer gates, the ones closest to the banks, are smaller. You can see they've already been shut, but it's the big ones under the water we have to get closed, and it's taken too damn long. And they have to be raised up, Blowfly grimaced. How heavy are these gates? About 3,300 tonnes each. OK, Blowfly breathed. That should be easy enough, then. You've done this before, right? Only in tests, Brunel replied. We've never had to do it while facing down a storm surge like this one. You have to prepare for the worst, but... You hope it'll never actually happen. And how much of London is on the floodplain? Jerome prompted them. About 125 square kilometres, Brunel told her. That's, that, that's a lot of it. Yes, and my house is slap bang in the middle of it. They all turned to stare at the barrier. The gates were being raised in pairs, the ones nearest the banks first, then the next ones in, and so on. The progress was painfully slow. The first two main gates were just rising above the water's surface. Each gate was like a lengthwise slice of cylinder, normally lying underwater, flush with the concrete base in the riverbed to keep it out of the way of boat traffic. When the huge hydraulic arms when the huge hydraulic arms on the towers rotated the axles, the steel slab rotated up from its base and swung into place to stand on its edge and block the path of the water. With the oncoming combination of a storm surge and the river already at high tide, the gates should have been shut over an hour ago. Even now, the level of the river was noticeably higher than normal. The police boat had reached the riverbank, and now the dead body was being lifted up to the assortment of investigators waiting to examine it. Blowfly and Germ walked over, joining the huddle of men and women who crowded round the drenched corpse. 
It was a young white woman, small and of slight build, with shoulder-length brown hair, a narrow pinched face, and 